So, uh, good afternoon. Um, very nice room. Um, okay, I'm Martin Wolf, and I uh, write for the Financial Times. Um, and it's my great pleasure to um, moderate this uh, discussion with uh, Francis Frank Fukuyama. Um, as always, I've, I've ha I have two pages of instructions. Um, feel like being back at school. So, first of all, are your mobile phones switched off? Uh, I don't know what will happen to you if uh, they are switched, if they remain switched on, but it's going to be very, very terrible and humiliating. Um, we would remind you that it's being filmed and live streamed. Um, so there are lots of people tuning in online, whom I welcome. And there's a hashtag, which is, I don't know, what do you, how do you do that? Pound RSAF RS Fukuyama. Um, and that's for the, those engaged in Twitter. I don't tweet myself. I regard it as a terrible, terrible, dangerous trap, um, particularly for people like me. So I, I avoid it like the plague. My colleagues, unfortunately, do not are not as wise as I am. Um, um, so uh, now let's start. We, um, I don't really think much uh, introduction is needed uh, for Frank. He's he is one of the world's most important and influential public intellectuals. I don't think there's any doubt about that. He, uh, his most celebrated work still, I regret to say, is The End of History and The Last Man, but he's written many incredibly important works since. And this work we're going to discuss today, this thin volume is the second volume of a two-volume study. I haven't yet read this book, but I have read the first one, which is, I think, absolutely brilliant. Um, and I think uh, will um, um, be of immense importance and rival one of the, uh, rival and in some ways surpass one of the works that I personally think is of the greatest things in this sort of area produced in the last 20 years, S.C. Finer's History of Government. And if you haven't read, which is even bigger, and it only gets up to 1900, but if you haven't read that, it was his last work, I do recommend that as well. In, it adds enormously. Um, the way we are going to proceed is he's going to talk for about 20 minutes about the book and what it's about. And then we're going to have a discussion of a couple of themes that come out of it. It's an enormous book. We could discuss many different issues, but we'll focus on a couple of themes. And then you will have the opportunity to ask questions um, in the last 15 minutes or so. Uh, just to make clear, please think about your questions. They should be questions, not speeches. And as I always like to say, I do know the difference. And I will cut you off because I do rude things like that. And if it's a nice, clear question, which gets a nice, clear answer, it would be very helpful and give more people an opportunity to participate since we don't have much time. So, Frank, uh, okay. start off. Fine, thank you. So, uh, thanks very much, Martin. Martin is an old friend of mine. I uh, should plug his book while I'm uh, up here because he's written a really excellent, uh, I mean, there are many books published on the financial crisis, but the one that he published this past month, uh, I think, uh, uh, synthesizes and then goes well beyond uh, what's out there. So, if you really want to know what went wrong in 2008 to 2010, uh, that's a great source. Uh, so thanks to RSA for inviting me. Uh, I'm really delighted to be in London. I will say uh, something about uh, the themes in this book. Uh, uh, probably the best place to start is actually just looking around the contemporary world. So I think the world is bifurcated into two broad areas. Uh, so honestly, 2014 has been an awful year. Uh, we have multiple crises going on and actually uh, I've not seen the world as unstable uh, as it is uh, right now in quite a lot of time, but the forms of instability are actually quite different. So in one part of the world, it goes from North Africa through Sub-Saharan Africa, the Arab world, uh, and into Afghanistan and Pakistan. Uh, you have uh, basically, uh, I would say now, a crisis of state authority where simultaneously Libya, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, all have um, failed central states that cannot keep order. And we've now been dealing with this new body that no one had heard about uh, previously, ISIS, uh, 
terrorist organization. Uh, they look like they're pretty bad people. But I don't believe that you know, these uh, high testosterone, you know, disaffected kids actually will create a state uh, except when they can take advantage of the weakness of other states. And the reason that these Islamists have flowed through into places like Mali and northern Nigeria, you know, with Boko Haram uh, and uh, regions like that, is that they don't have governments that can actually provide security for their citizens, and they're filling this kind of a, a vacuum. Uh, the other part of the world is Eurasia, where you have Russia and China at either end that are organized as hierarchical, centralized, bureaucratic states, uh, and they're very powerful, and they're making very traditional kinds of territorial claims uh, against their neighbors, and that actually throws us back into a 19th, 20th century world that's pretty familiar. It doesn't make it easier to deal with, but that you know, produces a kind of interstate uh, conflict that was the kind of staple of uh, earlier generations of, of uh, diplomats and, and, uh, and soldiers. Uh, I think the, the really difficult problem actually has been that weak state world in which state authority doesn't uh, exist, and a great deal of the foreign policy of the United States and Britain and other members of NATO in places like Afghanistan uh, and, uh, and Iraq has revolved around actually state building, is actually creating the basic uh, institutions of the state. And one thing that we, I think, have very painfully discovered is that the democracy part uh, of a modern state is actually not that hard to put into effect. So we've had democratic elections in both Iraq and Afghanistan. The really hard part is getting to actually a modern state that can deliver services, provide security, and is regarded as uh, legitimate. And that's really the, the overweening failure, I think, in both of those places in the, in the area where we didn't really understand how to do things. And so this was actually the beginning of this journey for both of the volumes of this book. Uh, I, I describe this problem as the one of getting to Denmark where Denmark is actually not a real country, but it's an imagined place that is democratic, secure, prosperous, uh, and uh, not corrupt. Uh, and we are constantly trying to turn countries like Iraq and Afghanistan into some version of Denmark, and we fail uh, constantly. And I uh, began to realize that the reason that we keep failing at this is that we don't understand how Denmark itself got to be Denmark. And having had a visiting professorship at Aarhus University for some years. I can guarantee you the Danes have no idea how they got to be there uh, either. Uh, and, and so this was the kind of historical journey. So the first volume uh, examines some very distant history, and the second one brings the story uh, up, to the, uh, up to the present. Uh, so I would say that um, we need to, uh, to back up a little bit uh, and uh, uh, talk about some basic institutions of government because this is you know, the, the, the terms of reference for, for my analysis. Uh, in my view, a modern political order really needs to consist of three baskets of institutions uh, that can be possessed in different combinations by different societies. So the first institution is the state. The state is defined by the famous sociologist Max Weber as a monopoly of legitimate force uh, over uh, a certain territory. Uh, and uh, this is the essence, I think, of stateness. It is actually coercion. It's the ability to enforce rules by being able to send a you know, police officer with a gun to say, you obey the state's rules or else you go to jail. Uh, so it's really about the uh, effective use of power, but it has to be legitimate. And in fact, I think the effective exercise of state authority has to be coupled with legitimacy. And in a way, that's why Iraq and Syria fell apart, uh, is that um, they, they had governments that were very coercive, but they, they were not regarded as broadly legitimate. There's another definition that distinguishes between uh, what Max Weber called a patrimonial state uh, and a modern state. A patrimonial state is one where the ruling elite regards the state as a species of private property to be exploited for their own use or the use of their families. Uh, and uh, I would say, and, and a modern state, by contrast, is one that is impersonal, meaning it treats its citizens uh, with some degree of equality, not depending on whether you're pals with the ruler and the ruling family or whatever, the ruling elite, uh, but simply as a citizen. Uh, 
And I think that this is basically what distinguishes a poor country from a developed country today. It isn't really actually the level of material wealth since a lot of uh, poor countries like Nigeria can actually get rich from, or certain citizens in those countries can get rich from things like oil. What distinguishes a, a poor country from a rich country is the ability to have a modern state that treats uh, citizens with some degree of impersonality. And that transition from a highly corrupt insider-run uh, organization to one that is um, uh, impersonal is one of the hardest transitions and one of the ones that we understand uh, the least well. All right, so that's one set of institutions. Another set of institutions has to do with the rule of law. Many countries rule through law. I mean, they're basically commands of the ruler. Uh, but rule by law means that the ruler uh, himself or herself feels constrained by law. And that's, again, a much harder thing to achieve. If the ruler can make up the rules as, uh, as they go along, uh, then that's not the rule of law. And therefore, the rule of law, in, understood in that sense, is one of the most important constraints on power. So the state produces power, but the rule of law constrains power. And then finally, you have uh, institutions of democratic accountability, uh, which are things like free and fair multi-party elections, uh, and again, these are simply procedures that are designed to force the rulers to take into account the interests of the whole population and not just their private uh, interests uh, or, or the interests of their families. And so what a modern political order consists of is something actually quite uh, contradictory that needs a certain kind of balance, that on the one hand, you need to develop a, a state that can actually rule and exercise uh, authority, but on the other hand, you need these other institutions of constraint, the rule of law and democratic accountability to make sure that that power is used in the interest of the public or the you know the the, the majority of uh, the citizens that uh, exist in that uh, country, and that is something that you absolutely cannot take for granted, and you can in a certain sense define the spectrum uh, of uh, the world's regimes. Uh, according to which of these institutions they possess and to what degree. So I would say at one end of the spectrum right now is, uh, is China, in which uh, you have a very long state tradition of actually a very modern state. This was an argument that I made in the first volume of my book that uh, Westerners have not acknowledged the fact. So a lot of countries had states early on like Egypt and Mesopotamia and you know Mexico in the Valley of Mexico, the Aztecs. But China was really the first country to develop a modern state in the sense of a bureaucratic administration that was merit-based and that sought to treat its large population relatively impersonally. And they did this uh, at the time of the Qin unification in the third century BC. So 1800 years before any state in Europe got to this level, the Chinese were already doing that. Their problem is they don't have institutions of constraint, so they really don't have anything like a rule of law that constrains the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, and of course, they don't have democratic uh, accountability. Uh, I would actually put a country like the United States at the other end of the spectrum. Uh, we do have a strong and, and very large state that can be very effective at times. But the American founding fathers, in a certain sense, uh, created, you know, they were very, very concerned with tyranny and the abuses of state power. So they created a constitutional system that divided and separated and checked power in uh, multiple ways, uh, such that in the United States, the exercise of concentrated government authority has always been uh, very difficult. And then in between, you've got lots of different mixtures. So you can have uh, a kind of stateless society with democracy, which is something like you know, Afghanistan, or you can have a society that has a state and the rule of law, but no democracy, which is Singapore, and so on and so forth. So there's no guarantee that you're actually going to get all three of these institutions in, uh, in a successful uh, balance. Uh, so as I said, I think that the, you know, one of the really big issues actually, uh, you know, we Americans especially uh, are really good at the rule of law and the democratic accountability parts. We run around the world trying to get countries to hold elections, and we have lots of legal advice. We know how to write constitutions and that sort of thing. But the harder issue is, is really the 
you know, the, the state building and the getting to this modern good governance kind of uh, state. Uh, I'll just give you a few brief examples of why this is important. So what happened in Ukraine over the past decade? In 2004, Ukraine was run by an elected president, a legitimately elected president, Viktor Yanukovych, who was basically a, uh, an insider you know, kleptocrat uh, who uh, was highly corrupt and ran a very corrupt administration. You had a democratic uprising called the Orange Revolution. Uh, they forced a new election, and he was basically removed from power. But the new Orange Coalition did not know how to govern. They were themselves corrupt. They did nothing to fix the underlying corruption of the Ukrainian state. They bickered internally. And as a result, Mr. Yanukovych was reelected in 2010 in a free and fair election. And the Euromaidan uprising that took place earlier this year was really about that. It was not so much about democracy as about corruption, because everybody admitted that Yanukovych actually had been democratically elected. The problem was he was running this insider ring uh, that was uh, extracting uh, resources from the Ukrainian state with the help of a bunch of oligarchs uh, and sharing it among himself and his cronies. And the issue about whether you sided with Russia or with the EU for the Ukrainians was entirely about whether you wanted to live under that kind of regime or something like you have in the EU that has impersonal states and you know, a much higher degree uh, of governance and lower levels of corruption and so forth. And I would maintain that in our coming struggle with Russia, you know, again, that's going to be the issue. I mean, nobody can test the fact that Mr. Putin wins democratic elections. So in some sense, the issue is not democracy. The issue is that he, too, is running a kleptocratic uh, 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 regime that is completely non-transparent in the way that uh, it uh, lives off the state's uh, resources. But the failure goes, uh, I think, deeper to other democratic uh, countries. So in India, there was a study done by uh, Jean Drez in the late 1990s that showed that in northern India, in some of the poor states, 50% of school teachers were not showing up for work uh, despite the fact that they were being paid, 50%. Uh, so this creates a big hue and cry in the country. There's efforts at political reform. Ten years later, they do a similar survey, and they find that the number of school teachers not showing up for work is exactly 50% after 10 years of effort. And, you know, in many respects, um, this inability to deliver electricity, clean water, basic education, you know, many of these infrastructure, many of these basic services uh, is something that the Indian government, uh, certainly at a national level, they're a little bit more successful in certain state governments, but at a national level, uh, it has been a huge struggle. And I think one of the reasons that uh, Narendra Modi was elected uh, 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 prime minister this year was that many Indians are fed up with this and they want strong government. They want a government that can actually make decisions and uh, move ahead and do things that are necessary to sustain uh, the country's rate uh, of, uh, uh, of economic uh, growth. Uh, and so, again, dealing with this basic inability of governments to produce things that people want to govern effectively, uh, I think is uh, really a challenge for democracies. Finally, uh, I'll get to the case of developed democracies because I think that uh, there's also a big problem there, beginning with uh, my own country, the United States. So there's no question that we've got you know, a state and rule of law and, um, uh, and democratic accountability. But I would say that we are subject to uh, something I've described as political uh, decay uh, because an impersonal government that is well run uh, and, and effective is a vulnerable thing uh, because elites in the country are constantly um, trying to recapture it and, and, and repatrimonialize it. Uh, and furthermore, I think countries are subject to institutional rigidity that we create a set of institutions for a certain set of circumstances and then when the circumstances change, we don't adapt mentally, we don't uh, uh, rebuild the institutions and as a result we're stuck with things that are quite uh, ineffective and I think that's really what's happened uh, in the United States. So the basic set of institutions, as I said, are this very complex set of checks and balances uh, 
in which action at every level of government is separated and checked and balanced by you know, competing institutions, very much in contrast to the Westminster system that exists uh, here in Britain. Uh, and that system through much of the 20th century worked okay because the two political parties overlapped uh, largely and you could get majorities to support major pieces of legislation. But American society has been drifting apart into an extremely bitter and I think extreme uh, degree of polarization so that the most liberal Republican is now much more conservative than the most conservative uh, Democrat. And as a result, they have engaged in a kind of partisan warfare, which when combined with a check and balance political system means that the country simply cannot make any of its most basic uh, governance decisions. U.S. Congress has not passed a budget since 2008 uh, under its own rules. And if you remember last year, the entire federal government shut down because of this dispute over raising the debt limit, which is basically an agreement to pay back uh, past debts. And under American law, in that period when the government was shut down, if you're a federal employee, you showed up for work, you were subject to a criminal penalty where you could go to jail for actually coming to your job. Uh, and, you know, and this is the United States of America. I mean, it's, it's a completely crazy system. And there are many areas of public policy like gun control, uh, immigration reform uh, that have been subject to this. The other aspect, I think, of political decay really has to do with interest groups. Uh, uh, I think probably the foremost example of this in my mind is one that Martin uh, has written about in his last book, but this simply has to do with the banking sector. So you have this huge financial crisis that in large part is brought about by these very powerful, too big to fail banks. Uh, there was an actual route to, I think, fairly decisively regulate, re-regulating uh, that sector to, that would, I think, have uh, solved a lot of the underlying problem, which was to, you know, for example, dramatically raise uh, capital requirements uh, on the banks that would keep them from getting, you know, that large. And then they could fail without it being, you know, bringing about taxpayer bailouts and so forth. But that whole avenue uh, was blocked, I think. Uh, I mean, this is something I cannot prove to you standing here uh, because a lot of this stuff is very murky. But uh, I uh, you know, honestly believe that that was really blocked because the lobbyists of the financial industry were simply too powerful. And so we got this very clumsy piece of legislation called Dodd-Frank uh, in its place. But there are many other you know, examples of this. The big health care legislation that Obama was, that was his other big achievement, but it's a, it's a horrible bill in, in many ways. It runs at 900 pages. Nobody that voted for it has any idea what's in those 900 pages because it involved payments you know, to a lot of different uh, interest groups that were necessary to get them on board so that the thing could be uh, passed in the first place. So I think that you know, in many respects there's been a reappropriation of the American government by well-organized and well-heeled <laughs> Uh, organized interests. And by the way, they're not all on the right. I mean, public sector unions in the United States are extremely powerful. Just to give you one little example, in my home state of California, uh, the California Teachers Association, uh, you get tenure as a teacher in California if you work for two years as a teacher. And, uh, and uh, there was a reform proposal to make that three years instead of two years. And this teachers union put up $100 million in a referendum to block uh, the, you know, the extension of the tenure waiting period uh, from two to three years. You know? And so it didn't happen. Uh, so there's a lot of vetoes, and this is why I say that America's ended up as what I call a vetocracy, meaning uh, a government in which uh, it is extremely easy for minorities to veto uh, actions by the, uh, you know, the whole that are necessary, I think, for uh, public interest. So, I'm going to leave it there. So this, I think, uh, kind of sets up uh, a larger discussion about um, problems of governance in uh, 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 different kinds of regimes. And I look forward to uh, our discussion. Thank you very much. So thank you very much for the splendid introduction of your themes. I'd like to start, I was thinking as you talked, um, 
about something you didn't mention. You talk, it seems to me, sort of shine out from what you're saying. You talk about the three dimensions of modernity, if I may use this word, the state, the rule of law, and democratic accountability. Um, and you pointed out that effective states can exist without the rule of law, as we understand in democracy, yeah. and that China in particular, in many respects, um, pioneered um, the modern state. What I was thinking about as you talked, and because, partly because of my own background, long before I became an economist, I was a classicist, and so fairly imbued with Greek and Roman views of this, which of course immensely influenced the Founding Fathers, though that's now largely forgotten, um, is that one of the things they would say, and it's clearly central to the Chinese success, is that behind these things is, and they're obviously different in different contexts, a set of values, attitudes and behaviours that are within the population, they're in people's hearts. They evolve, obviously, in different ways. Weber discusses that at great length. Um, the Romans would have called it virtue. Um, and the Chinese obviously created this within their context through this Confucian ideology in their bureaucracy. So it's not just about some sort of mechanical system of institutional yeah. structures. It's about actually how are people think about themselves, their relationship to others in their society, their relationships to power, that what they expect of the yeah. powerful. And the reason it's so difficult to change is pretty obviously changing the broader culture yeah. of a society simply must, as is, we know from our own history, take immense amount of time and preserving it, we'll come to that in a moment, is also something that might be proved difficult. Mm -hmm. How do you respond to that? meta issue? Well, I think it's absolutely correct as an observation. I haven't emphasized it because it leads you to some rather depressing <laughs> conclusions in terms of the malleability of different uh, societies. So, for example, um, East Asia is home to a large number of what uh, are called developmental states. So this is like Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, and China itself, in which the government doesn't just provide a platform for the free market, it actually directs economic development. Now the big problem with industrial policy of this sort or developmental states is once you exercise political power and override markets, it's easy to abuse. And there's many, many developing countries that have tried to do this and it's ended up a complete disaster, you know, Argentina, Argentina Pakistan and so forth. But it's worked pretty well in East Asia and why is it that you, you get these developmental states in this part of the world and not in other regions. And I think it is a cultural uh, thing where East Asian elites have this sense of public responsibility, even if they're actually personally corrupt and you know, not very nice people, certainly very authoritarian. So you know, uh, Park Chung-hee, for example, who was the military general that took over South Korea in 1961, uh, one of the first things he did was he got all the leaders of the big Korean chai bowl, these big companies like Samsung and Hyundai, uh, who were corrupt themselves, and he paraded them down the street of Seoul in dunce caps, and he told them, you, uh, you know, I will, let, I will let, keep you out of jail, but you have to plow uh, a very large proportion of your earnings back into your own companies. Now, if this had been Nigeria or you know, uh, Mexico or some other place, an authoritarian leader in that position would have said to these people, he wouldn't have put him out in public, he would have said, okay, give me, you know, 75% and I'll let, you, I'll let you stay out of jail, right? So 75% would have been reinvested in those industries, they would have uh, just gone into the pockets of the elite. I mean, you know, Nigeria, you know, apparently the president of Nigeria provided a big subvention in order to fight Boko Haram earlier this year, and the money has completely disappeared into the pockets of the people that are actually supposed to be protecting you know, the people of northern Nigeria. So there's something cultural. And, and actually, uh, if you look at the best governed countries in northern Europe or in the United States or in this country, a lot of them were Calvinists, you know, uh, or they had this Calvinist kind of austerity and belief in you know, personal morality, 
that I think uh, is actually part of the story of how you got to good government in Prussia, you know, in Holland, in Britain, and in the United States. Uh, so that's why I say I don't like emphasizing this part of the story because it becomes very, in terms of public policy, it becomes very discouraging because you can't say, well, we just need more Calvinists running, you know, <laughs> Zimbabwe or, you know, Nigeria or, or, or something. But that it does sort. suggest, doesn't it, that the idea, which was after all very current, not so long ago, and then we'll go to us, that you could arrive in a country, overthrow its government and inculcate That's a right. modern state and democracy in 10 years was completely absurd. That's right. Yeah, and Afghanistan is a great case of that. I mean, we've known that Karzai and you know, his minions are just unbelievably corrupt and that this is undermining the legitimacy of the whole NATO project in Afghanistan, and we have not figured out a way of dealing with this. Now let's turn to decay. You find yourself in the uncomfortable position, or at least I imagine it might be uncomfortable, of, of making an argument which is very similar to one Neil Ferguson has recently been making, because um, uh, he wrote a recent book on decay. Um, and it's sort of fashionable pessimism at the moment um, about, so I'm talking about the developed Western democracies, mm -hmm. so let's focus for the moment on the, your own and Western Europe. The, 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 the um, pathologies you describe are obviously persuasive in the sense they exist, and we are obviously having great problems in making effective decisions which <coughs> represent the interests of the great majority of the population. I think that's pretty clear. Um, and in your analysis, it's partly because, and you brought it up, this constantly a fight by powerful groups to seize back for themselves the power and wealth that, at least in theory, is, is under the general rule for the interests of everybody. Yes. Do you think it's possible to reverse this decay? And if so, yeah. what will be required? Uh, it's, it's completely possible, and another story that I tell in this book uh, is actually when that happened during the progressive era. So, and this is the theory of how democracies are supposed to work. So in a democracy, if a small elite is corrupt or it's seizing undue influence, because you have one man, one vote, or one person, one vote, everybody, you know, the vast majority of citizens should not want this to happen. They mobilize and they vote. Uh, to change the rules so that these people are not allowed to do this. That's the theory. The problem is, and, and that's actually, I think, pretty much what happened uh, in the progressive era when you had civil service reform, so they got rid of uh, the patronage system because of this general mobilization. After the uh, Depression in the 1930s, you had a general mobilization that Franklin Roosevelt you know, put together uh, in, in the form of the New Deal coalition that then put the American welfare state in place, but it doesn't happen automatically. And one of the, I think, troubling things about the current moment is that despite the fact that you've had this huge financial crisis that's hurt the interest of a lot of ordinary people, the only mobilizations you've had are right-wing ones that are populist and I think aim the gun at the wrong people like immigrants and so forth. Uh, and, and you know, there hasn't been the appropriate response to get, for example, adequate, uh, you know, regulation and, and, and this sort of thing. So it's not an automatic pro process, but I think the problem is fu fundamentally political, and therefore the solution has to be fundamentally political. Isn't part, I mean, this is a U.S. aspect, and there are obviously aspects here, but you have a, the U.S. has a constitution which is interpreted by the Supreme Court, uh, and this, this, the the Constitution isn't too clear on a number of things. Uh, the, the, the Supreme Court is chosen by the other two branches, which, uh, in which the interest groups you mentioned yeah. are very, very powerful. Now, if you get a Supreme Court majority that decides that money is speech and that corporations are people, it's going to become rather difficult to reverse this, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and this is why I think that the rigidity is part of our problem of decay, that you know, the Supreme Court is one of those checks uh, that, that the Constitution creates. But it's actually the rule of law, as it were, is actually subverting That's democratic right. accountability, at least right. is the way I see it. So your three elements, and in the process weakening the state, yes. so your three elements are, are actually at war with one another That's in right. some profound way. Yeah, which is why, in my view, uh, a good uh, political order is one in which there's an appropriate balance, but I think that's absolutely right. 
we have too much law and we have actually in certain ways uh, too much democratic accountability uh, uh, in, uh, in our society and we need to shift the balance back. Uh. Now let me turn to the other, before I go to questions to the floor, the other, you know, it's a pretty obvious challenge. You, you've written a lot in the earlier book, and I presume in this one too, about China, which is obviously a fantastically important country, that's self-evident, also a fantastically interesting one in terms of the history that you describe, which I've been very interested now in for decades. Um, now, to many people, certainly outside the West, China is now seen uh, or even promoted in some respects as an alternative model of modernization. Uh, it is modernizing in the obvious ways we're familiar with. It's becoming an industrial society. There's been an enormous increase in wealth. There's no doubt about that. Not, not equally shared for sure, but certainly quite widely shared. It's becoming a great power. It has become a great power on any measure. Um, it's shown itself to be in many ways extraordinarily effective. Its elite, whom you and I met, are remarkably well educated, often at institutions in the West. Um, and it's very clearly said, uh, most decisively, of course, in 1989, that the democracy thing is not what we're about. The, not only is there a Communist Party monopoly of law and it's in, it's elements of accountability you can discuss, but actually, with the current president, mm -hmm. Xi Jinping, it's, it's clear it's becoming more authoritarian. So two questions arise. Is this a model of modernization, obviously attractive, as the Soviet Union was, as I remember this very well, when yes. I started in development at the World Bank. Is this a model that the West should see as a genuine rival for um, credibility in the world? And... Is it, the second question, a model that you think can really be sustained if you think about your other you know, accountability in the rule of law? Certainly, Mr. Xi Jinping is clearly not subject to the rule of law as you, as you or I would understand it, and he's certainly not accountable to votes. Is it a model that is compatible with turning even China with its very different histories into what you would think of as a flourishing, modern, yeah. uh, pluralistic, state, or is it at some point going to lead to some form of political crisis? It's, really, it's still a relatively poor country despite its enormous advances. Yeah. Well, on the first question, I would say definitely that of all the alternatives out there, this is the only one that I take seriously as, a, as an alternative, because who wants to be the Islamic state of the Levant, you know, I mean, or Iran, or, you know, the, <laughs> Uh, Hugo Chavez is Venezuela. I mean, these are ridiculous. But China is a serious contender because it's growing very rapidly and it's got its act together in many ways. So, uh, so the really uh, important question is the second one, which is the sustainability. And I would say uh, a couple things about that. That the so the the one problem that Chinese government never solved, either in dynastic times or today, is the problem of what they call the bad emperor. Mm -hmm. So if you have a good emperor, and I think this is pretty commonsensical, if you have a good emperor with unchecked power and the emperor is really good, they can do a lot of good and they can do it much faster than a democracy with all the checks and balances. So, uh, and in fact, if you think about what Deng Xiaoping did in terms of reforming the Chinese system, overcoming the resistance of all the old communists and Maoists and so forth, no democracy could have sh changed its economic system as rapidly as China did, and it's only because it was authoritarian and unconstrained that you could do this. Uh, but in Chinese history, there's this trope about the bad emperor that uh, <laughs> all of this is premised on having a good emperor, but the moment you get a bad one in there, that same lack of constraint can lead to disaster. And I think most Chinese believe that the last bad emperor they had was Mao Zedong, who killed you know tens of millions of people through famine and you know, uh, uh, terrible policies, the cultural revolution, and so forth. And so that's, I think, their problem. And with Xi Jinping, I think our problem is we actually don't know whether he's a good emperor or a bad emperor. I mean, I've heard more liberal Chinese say he is purging all these people because he has to accumulate enough power to be able to move against the vested interests, but his goal is going to be to really liberalize and open up the country. So that's plausible. Maybe that's going to happen. 
but he could actually be a bad emperor. You know, he could be another Mao Zedong in the making who will use this unconstrained power for really tyrannical uh, purposes. And I, at, at this point, I just think we don't know which one of these scenarios is possible, but that speaks to the unsustainability of the, you know, of the system because the one thing that checks and balances do, it can injure the good performance of a, of a country, but it puts a certain floor under the bad performance. You know, there's a, there's a check against bad emperors in a, in a democracy, uh, and that just doesn't exist in China right now. Isn't there, I mean, perhaps this is the last thing on that, but there is another aspect of it which perhaps goes a little bit beyond government. I mean, I suppose if you are, as I am, rather sympathetic to the Western model, um, put it sort of gently, I mean, you would say in addition that by giving people, however uh, you know, corrupt and problematic it often is, a say in public life, freedom of speech and freedom also to engage in economic activity. You are ultimately relying to a very, very large extent for the future of your, your country on the efforts and energies of the entire population. Yeah. And it's not perfect, all sorts, but don't you feel that in the very long run, particularly as you get closer and closer to the frontier, a society for all the incredible mess and problems so forth, like the US with its constant ability to innovate, to change. You know, where are the, the new ideas coming from even now? Um, that it, this is a pretty big advantage, which yep. China yep. cannot easily replicate if everything to some degree has to be approved by the Communist Party? Yeah, well, we'll have to see about it, but it's a fascinating question whether they can genuinely innovate as opposed to imitate without political freedom. and, and uh, I, I think the judgment is, is still out, but I would go further than you. It's not just useful to have the whole population engaged. I think it's an intrinsic value, yeah. value for yeah. human beings, that they should have a share in rule over themselves. So Aristotle said that man is a political animal, by which you know he meant if you don't exercise some degree of share in rule, you're not leading a full life. And I think the Chinese will not have that because their government treats them as children. So I think it's, you know, there's a lot of reasons why we should prefer living in a liberal democracy. And that's an idea, as far as I can see, was never really central in any, at least any post-imperial notion of statecraft in China. That's right. So I'm going to take some questions. I'll take about three. Um, say who you are, ask it very briefly. The gentleman here. Yes, you. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I'm sorry. There's a microphone. Okay. There's a microphone. But I think for the recordings, very important. I'm Sajid Khan. Uh, I'm just going to stick to a very simple question because you've opened the field to so much. In England, we have, I think, a fairly a very tolerant and well-ordered society, but we don't have a written constitution. It's partly written, of course, but mostly it's by convention. Yet, when in power overseas, for example, with the French in, uh, after the Ottoman Empire fell down. Can you get to the question, please? I, the question is very simple. I've just explained why I'm asking this. That under French bayonets in 1926, they imposed the Constitution, which had the president was going to be a Christian, in effect a Maronite. The prime minister was going right. to be Sunni, and so on. So uh, the question is because of the sectarianism which is so prevalent just now. Now, United States and Britain together, I suppose, but mostly United States, have imposed a constitution on Iraq, which has a <laughs> the president will be Kurd, which in fact Sunni, yeah. and the prime minister Sorry, will be Sorry, this is not a question. This is a speech. No. Please ask a one-sentence question. There are 20 people who want to ask questions. So ask the what question. What is your view of imposing constitutions? Thank you very question? much. The gentleman yeah. next to you. You, please. May I ask? Um, I'm David Alexander from University College London. I'd like to ask, do you see Europe moving towards federalism? Very good. Lady down here. Then I'll go to the back. Okay. Just a question from Twitter. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the size of the state being too big or too small. What size is the Goldilocks state or is there a Goldilocks state? Okay. 
Okay, let's go with these three, three questions. Okay. Imposing constitutions, European federalism, and what's the optimal size of the state? Yeah, so in general, I think that the best constitutions are one that somehow come organically uh, out of the society uh, itself, but sometimes the society is not capable of getting to a constitution. Uh, and I think the Lebanese constitution was actually a pretty pragmatic effort to deal with this extreme degree of sectarian fragmentation. And it's very interesting. If you look at the power sharing agreement that's now evolving in Afghanistan, they're moving to something that looks very much like Lebanon, where the president will be a Pashtun, the prime minister will be a Tajik, and then other offices will be shared. And I think they're getting that to that point on their own. Uh, just, and it's not pretty, but you know, that's, that's the only way that they can, they can manage this. So the EU federalism question is a really important one. Uh, and it worries me. I mean, I think you obviously have to have a federal system in Europe, but I actually think that it's beginning to look, uh, unfortunately, too much like the United States. So the United States is a federal system, but it doesn't really observe the principle of subsidiarity in which powers are clearly at, advocated to, uh, allocated to the appropriate level. What we have in the United States is a, is a set of duplicated and overlapping uh, authorities at every single level. So. There's a municipal and a state and a federal environmental protection agency, all of which have different uh, agendas and so forth. And one of the problems is that in terms of things like lobbying, it produces a lot more entry points into government where you know, uh, things can be uh, manipulated. So the design of that is, is really, really important. And that last question on the size of the state, that's a softball question that I'm really happy to hit out of the park because one of the arguments I make well, you'll see whether it's hit out of the park or not. But one of the arguments that I make in the book is that the quality of the state is much, much more important than the size of the state. That we Americans obsess about whether the state is too large or too big, and we should be much more worried about the quality. So, you know, in Denmark, my favorite Denmark, they used to have a top marginal tax rate of 63.5%, and you hit that at 100,000 euros. Uh, so they had an enormous state, but you know, people liked it because it delivered services pretty well. Uh, whereas there are many small states in Africa and Latin America where they don't take in more than 10% of GDP in taxes, and they do a miserable job at that, and everybody's really unhappy. So I think quality is much more important than quantity. Frank, of course, used a baseball metaphor. What he really meant was hitting a six. Um, <laughs> the gen gentleman at the back there, yes. Uh, um, Professor Phil to Renault University. Um, if, this is just two sentences, if uh, a state, a liberal democracy, in effect, uh, depends upon overlapping narratives that people have a certain agreement about, hasn't there been a kind of corrosive element from the identity politics that was pervaded in the 60s and that's kind of expanded into a kind of whole uh, dimension of um, those social narratives? Good. A gentleman there? Yeah. You, please. Uh, Matthew Meze, RSA. I know that Lawrence Harrison and his colleagues all around the world have been trying to work on those kind of cultural changes you talked about, and I'm just wondering whether you're thinking that their effort is just a cul-de-sac and a fool's errand and they, they're really never going to be able to make those kind of cultural changes, positive cultural changes. Um, lady here. You're all being wonderfully disciplined. We'll get through a lot of questions. Wendy Moman, London School of Economics. Do the principles that you discussed also apply to the international stage? Okay. Oh, God. Okay, three good questions. Identity politics? Yeah, so, um, so identity is really critical to state building and state formation. And uh, in a sense, I mean, I got a couple chapters that are devoted to this that if you don't actually have an overarching sense of identity for your, that corresponds to your political unit, you're actually not going to get people to be loyal to that unit as opposed to their tribe or ethnic group or family or whatever. So that's actually critical. Um, but you're right that uh, identity, since it's socially constructed, can go in a lot of different ways. And there's been this uh, tendency to emphasize you know, smaller and smaller uh, local identities. I actually think that this is very much connected to uh, the, you know, what I label the end of history. I mean, if, if you didn't have an agreement, fundamental agreement on democracy and 
a market system underpinning uh, prosperity, you actually couldn't indulge in identity politics. So, for example, if Scotland, uh, by leaving the United Kingdom, were cast off by itself, not connected to any larger economic entity, and they would get very poor as a result, you know, I don't think they'd even for a minute contemplate that. So, in a sense, the current you know, type of identity politics takes as a foundation the existence of these larger you know, institutions of globalization, free trade, uh, and democratic peace uh, to actually uh, work. But, and the question, I guess, down the road is, will that get out of the hand, and is that manageable? Uh, on the question of, of Larry Harrison and, and culture, I, so I guess the difference between him and me is he thinks that culture is like 80% of the variance between the performance of different countries, and I think it's more like 10 to 15%. It's, it's there, it's important, uh, but there are many other things that are more important, and it turns out that you can change institutions, and all of a sudden things that people thought were cultural obstacles uh, disappear. So Max Weber himself wrote this entire book in which he's got this one great line. It's a book on Taoism and Confucianism, and he says at one point, the only country less likely to create a modern capitalist system, less likely than China, is Japan. And he wrote that book in about 1920. Um, and so things change, and it turns out people you know, are kind of lazy and attribute things to culture that actually are the result of institutions or public policies that are uh, subject to change. So on the question of international, uh, I think that uh, I don't think that on an international level we will ever get to anything like the state because the state requires this huge delegation of discretionary authority to some executive agency that can then basically use power. And if you don't have an underlying uh, political consensus about how that power is to be used and how to allocate resources and everything else, it's just, it's, it's, well, it's, it's first dangerous, but then even before it's dangerous, it just is politically unworkable. And I, I see no route uh, by which we're going to you know, ever see the emergence of truly international institutions with those sorts of powers. So for the time being, I think we're stuck with you know, intergovernmentalism or transnational you know, cooperation uh, that still takes the nation state. I mean, some, some exceptions like the EU, uh, which is a bit of an intermediate creature, but uh, you know, you go to Asia, I mean, there's no way that you're going to get anything beyond the nation state uh, anytime in the near, near future. I can't avoid going in there. I, my view on this increasingly is that effective global governance is both essential and impossible. And it's probably the biggest challenge we now confront. I wrote about climate today. Gentleman down there, in the front. Probably the last round, I'm afraid. Thank you very much. Uh, Mohammed bin Madani, Maghreb Review. Um, I took one question. The failure of states in the Middle East, was this due to the local politics or to the interference of outside power like the United States? Uh, second question, if I may. Corruption. Sometimes it's very good for local economy. And it does help to agree, as long as you keep it under control. Yeah. So that's enough. Thank you. <laughs> One and a half will do. Okay. Gentlemen, all the way back to the right there. Um, the second part is optional, since so two questions. Yeah, very I couldn't cheeky. have sat in a more awkward seat. In, in terms of the predeterminates you require, do you not think we, in the international community, get it in the wrong order? You, we, we rush in and say we must have elections, um, but I think establishing the rule of law is more important first, because people will not vote with confidence if they don't believe that the rule of law, the, co the, the legitimate coercion of the state is available to them. So elections are very attractive, but maybe we should get them in the right order. Okay. Um, you. Sorry, this is somewhat arbitrary, I apologize. Never had an audience where so many people wanted to ask questions. Yes. I apologize for all those that we won't manage to. The meet session's too short. Where do you see Western democracies in the next 50 years? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? Uh, 
Okay. Okay. <laughs> Who so, was responsible for the failure of the Middle East? <laughs> you know, it's hard to answer that question because I think the survival of many of those authoritarian regimes like the Mubarak regime in Egypt was due to Western interference. I mean, the United States was supporting this guy. And so the fact that, uh, you know, we did something after the Tahrir Square uprisings, I think is much less important than what we were doing, you know, prior to that. And so the, you know, the success of these authoritarian states was, was also the, the result of, uh, of meddling. Uh, so, you know, that's, there, that did happen, but I do think in a place like Iraq, if you say, why did, why did ISIS arise, you know, as it did this year, I would say the, the bulk of the failure is really um, Prime Minister Maliki, I mean, who's got to be one of the worst, you know, founding fathers of any country, you know, I can, I can imagine. The corruption there, I just want to say, yeah, I know a lot of people have made the argument that corruption smooths, smooths transactions and so forth, but it's definitely a second best alternative to actually having a non-corrupt system in the first place where you don't have to pay the bribes and, and, and so it's forth. It's a really big issue in China that yeah. you didn't emphasize. You talked to Chinese yes. people. I mean, that is corrosive of legitimacy. It is. And has always been corrosive yes. of legitimacy in China. Yes, no, that's right. And there is a serious question about whether without actually free press and, you know, ground, uh, 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 grassroots ability to hold officials accountable, whether you can actually deal with corruption. Uh, on the question of uh, elections versus rule of law, yeah, so in theory, if you could create a Reichstag, you know, in Iraq and then have elections, you know, 25 years later, fine. <laughs> but that's really hard. I mean, first of all, nobody can sequence these days in, in that fashion. And the other observation is that both state building and rule of law construction are much, much harder to do. If you think about what's required for rule of law, first of all, you've got to train lawyers, you've got to train judges, you've got to create bar associations, you've got to create a, a kind of legal culture and then make them independent of the government. And that's a generational or multi-generational task, whereas the, I think the reason we go for elections quickly is that they're just easy to, 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 to do. 50 years in democracy, I don't know. I, uh, you know, uh, we who live in democracies like to tell ourselves that we have these self-corrective mechanisms and whatever our problems, we may be slow and inefficient, but eventually we get around to correcting them. Uh, so far, uh, that's happened, but uh, there's no guarantee that that'll happen uh, in the future, and it really does depend on the agency of us as individuals and as collectivities to, you know, to make sure that it happens. So, no... No predictions are offered. I do, however, um, as a normative issue, uh, still fail to see how there's a really convincing alternative out there. So if this project uh, doesn't succeed, I think that's actually quite a, great, uh, uh, quite, a, quite a great tragedy. So in some sense, the end of the book is, it's, at least it, as it's addressed Western audiences like this, it's a sort of call to arms. Yeah. We, we can't envisage a better system, so we really should make, work harder to make the one we have work better. That's right. That's right. Um, remember that. It has a, an optimistic and a hortatory function, this book. It's not just a col colossal amount of very, very interesting analysis. I've dipped into it. I'm supposed to end it here. I, I wouldn't, I'm not going to summarize this. I apologize to all those who didn't uh, get to ask their questions, but I think we've had a wonderful and fascinating tour d'horizon of what Frank thinks. I, um, uh, there are copies of his book on sale, and he's going to give you a signature if you buy, so I think uh, that's pretty attractive. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, I've increasingly, I've moved away from electronic books. I know there are advantages you travel around, but there's something real about something like this. And, <laughs> And, and you it, can use it as a and doorstop. A, and, as, <laughs> and as somebody once wrote, I'm trying to remember, God, I get so uh, forgetful. But as somebody once said, books do furnish a room. And this one certainly will furnish a lot of room. So you should get it, buy it and get it signed. So finally, please thank uh, Frank Fukuyama for his wonderful book. <laughs>